Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. Now, I hope you're ready for a Reverend Ronnie Lister. He comes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me, let me, let me, do, the, let me do the round. I need to do this thing. He has so many accolades, we couldn't probably even fit them in before he has a chance to talk. So he has asked me to say two things about him. This is what. He holds a master's degree from Fuller Theological Seminary, which you will not be in any doubt of when you hear him speak. And he and his wife, Reverend Ann K. Lister, are the founders of the International Center for Spiritual and Social Activism. This interfaith organization and educational center focuses on empowering workers, social justice, and building the beloved community of which he is about to tell us everything he knows about the building that beloved community. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Ronnie Lister. giving honor to God, the creator and the sustainer of life, the grantor and the giver of every good and perfect gift unto us, who sustains the heavens above our heads and the ground beneath our feet, and who causes the insects to crawl through the grass, and who is the imminent expressions, expression of all of life, seen and unseen. How immensely grateful I am to be a participant in this supreme Sunday morning worship occasion. And I want to thank my friend, uh, Reverend Karen Tudor, for those beautiful things that she said about me and my wife. Uh, most of it was true. Uh, not all of it. About 99 and a half and three-fourths of it was true. I want to thank my friend in his absence, my distinguished friend and colleague, Reverend Michael Gott, who is the pastor of this church. And I want to thank all of you who have your nerve of coming here to hear me preach. <laughs> you got your nerve. I want to invite you to think deeply with me. It is not necessary, it will not be necessary for you to say amen, you probably won't say amen anyway, but I want you to think deeply with me today. I am not necessarily here to celebrate African American History Week because I celebrate African American history every day that I live on this earth. You can look at my physiology. And that is not only true for African Americans and people of my particular physiology, that is true for every human being. We should celebrate our humanity every day. Because regardless of what your particular physiology is, we are all part not only of Unity Church, not only American citizens, but we are citizens of God's world. We are citizens of universal facts. 
We are citizens of that which is and that which is yet to come. We haven't seen anything yet. We saw, we witnessed, many of us did, some of us did not, did not but those my age and, un, and over witnessed the episode of the civil rights struggle of the 1950s and 60s and 70s. We witnessed the uprising of the feminist movement. We witnessed young people coming out talking about justice and love. But I got news for you. We haven't seen anything yet. Wait until the love and the knowledge of God covers this planet. As the waters cover the sea. We are going in that direction. And those of who do not want to see that happen on this earth, you're going to be left behind. But that is not my sermon. Because I have, I have been placed under time constraints. <laughs> I'm not fussing because of that. I'm just stating a fact. Because uh, if I were not placed under time constraints, I would be here until tomorrow afternoon by myself. <laughs> In the book of Galatians, chapter 3, there is a verse from the writing of St. Paul that I would like to read. I will not read the context. The context includes the entirety of the book of Galatia. But I invite you to read it on your own time. That is your homework assignment. Read, read, read. My dad used to tell me that, read, cut that TV off, read. And so I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, the same to you, read the book of Galatia, study it, do not read it from the King James Version because King James killed his wife. <laughs> you are laughing, but that is true. He did kill his wife, but that has nothing to do with the translation of the King James out of Hebrew out of Greek into English. Has nothing to do with that, but I thought I would mention it to keep you from reading the King James Version. <laughs> because it is a poor translation of the Bible. I would invite you and recommend that you read it from the New, Inter uh, New International Version, the NIV and or the RSV, anything except the King James Version. <laughs> So read the context. Here is the verse. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer barbarian or Sakathian. For we are all one in Christ Jesus. I began with this story illustration. Several years ago, in fact, many years ago, there was a young man who uh, used to brag uh, to his sister that he was a better cook than she was. And uh, she kept telling him that he could not cook, that he was not a good cook, he uh, did not know what he was doing, and she offered to help him uh, cook a cake that he wanted to cook. And so he uh, got the, reci the recipe, read the recipe, got all of the ingredients out of the cabinet, placed them on the kitchen counter, and uh, I guess he thought he was reading the recipe correctly and put this in their egg, nut and egg, whatever y'all women put in these cakes, uh, <laughs> and uh, stirred it up, and he put the... Um, the, 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 the bowl of, of the mixed ingredients in a baking pan and put the baking pan in the oven. And after maybe 30 or 40 minutes, however, takes these cakes uh, to cook, uh, he took the cake out and put it on the oven and it looked like something out of Alfred Hitchcock's horror story. <laughs> 
In fact, the cake looked like it was going to jump out at you out of the pan and grab you. <laughs> Needless to say, it was a culinary catastrophe. <laughs> because he failed to put the necessary ingredients in the cake that made it look like a cake. <laughs> and this is why I am reading from the letters of Paul. Oh, yes, the young man who did that. The reason I know about that story, because I was that young man. <laughs> when we want to do anything essential and meaningful in life, it may be wise to receive advice, wisdom, and direction from someone who has done what you are trying to do. And Paul is an example of someone who was building the great beloved community in his time. This is why I have chosen to read from him. Now, he was not the only one. Jesus and others of other religious expressions, but today I'm focusing on Paul because I know about him better than some of the others. And in the text before us, it is theologically evident that he knows something about what he is talking about. Paul was a mystic, a thinker, a writer, a scholar, a progressive. So progressive was he that he gave the early Jesus movement, or the hierarchy, let me say, of the early Jesus movement, he gave them the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> I do not know what that is. You can go find it out. <laughs> but he was always at odds with the church hierarchy of his time because he was on the move and others working with him were on the move toward building not just a church. They were committed to building the global community which consists of all expressions of humanity that God has placed upon this earth. He was a progressive. Listen to something that he wrote to the Roman church. Listen. This is indicative of how progressive he was. He says, I recommend to you. Now, this is someone giving, making a recommendation who is not a part of the church hierarchy, but he had a following. Listen, I recommend to you our sister Phoebe. That's a woman. A deacon of the church at Centuria, so that you may welcome her in the Lord and help in whatever way she may require of you. In a deeply patriarchal society where women were perceived to be inferior to men, Paul is recommending her to another position in the early church. She was already a deacon, a deacon at the church at Centuria, not a deaconess. There's no such thing as a deaconess. <laughs> That's a patriarchal term that we men made up to demean women. Amen. But he recommends her to another position, maybe a position as a deacon in another church. And the point that I'm trying to make, help us to see is that here is Paul, 2,000 years replaced from our immediate existence, making a recommendation for a woman to a higher position. And we have churches in the 21st century who are still debating whether or not women should be in the ministry. Child, good evening. <laughs> he was a progressive. He was a progressive. 
This is how his mind works. He's not a part of the, of the, of the old boys club. And when one reads and studies his writings in depth, one gets the sense, again, that building God's beloved community was the essential primary concern of Paul, not just building a church. Now, he did not always think like this. If you read the book of Acts, chapter 8, chapter 9 in particular, and read his, uh, his history, his background, you would discover that Paul was a terrorist prior to his encounter with Jesus. Terrorist, a real one. <laughs> he was in the business of destroying the early Jesus movement. Why? Because the thinking and the progressiveness of the, er of the early Jesus movement was against his way of thinking, against his way of viewing life, of viewing other people who did not look like him. But one day, while he was riding on a horse going to Jerusalem to commit terrorism, Light came out of the heavens and knocked him on the ground. And the horse fell on the ground because the light blinded the horse. And he was blinded for three days. But his testimony, his own acknowledgement is that though the light gave him physical blindness, he began to see spiritually. It was at that time that his, his world began to change. That God began to work on his cerebellum medulla oblongata. <laughs> and, and God began to change and turn him around. And this is why later on, several years down the road, he's able to say he was a racist. He was a terrorist. He was a knucklehead. <laughs> but he was a very brilliant man. But he was very sick. And this is why years later, after the Damascus Road encounter with the light shining from heaven, he's able to write, there is no longer Jew nor Greek. There is no longer male or female. There is no longer slave or free. But we're all one in Christ Jesus. So my brothers and sisters, the first ingredient that must go into the bowl, and I'm using the term bowl as a metaphor to describe our lives. The first ingredient to go into the bowl for the recipe of building God's beloved community is the power of evolving thought. Right. All of life all of life consists of thought. You and I thought about coming here, and that's why we're here. You and I thought about the clothes that we were going to wear today, and we are now wearing the clothes that we thought about. The automobile that you are driving now, you gave it some thought. The person that you are married to now, I guess you gave it some thought. If you didn't, it will probably give you some thought. <laughs> or at least give you something to think about. <laughs> but all of life is thought. Nothing happens without thinking. Someone thought about building this beautiful facility. I think you get the point. And so, and so thought consists of cells in the brain that work in cooperation with the mind to produce behavior and decision making. To be able to think is a mighty and powerful gift from God. What are thoughts? Thoughts consist of cells, yes, but thoughts are also perceptions, ideas, assumptions, information, misinformation, plans, uh, perspectives, Opinions, worldviews, habits, socializations, beliefs, and unbeliefs. Someone has rightly asserted that when one changes their thoughts, their life changes. I don't know who came up with that. That's not my statement. I'm <laughs> quoting from somebody. I hear people make stuff all the time that you make, they, and they're quoting somebody else, but you don't know that they're quoting because they don't tell you that they're quoting. 
I'm telling you, that's not my statement. I heard that from somebody else. So when our thoughts change, our life automatically begins to change. And hateful thoughts are not eternal. They can be changed to loving thoughts, like Paul changed his thoughts. Self-deprecating thoughts can be changed to thoughts of worth and value and dignity and self and self-care. Thoughts of violence uh, can be and rage can be changed to thoughts of, of nonviolence and tranquility. Thoughts of a lack of integrity can be changed to thoughts of integrity. And you can rise to the heights of being a principal human being. And so regardless of what the nature of your thinking is now, it can change for the better. That's what happened to the writer of this text. When, when our thoughts change, my brothers and sisters, family, when our thoughts begin to change, we become more than just talking about the beloved community. We become the walking, breathing reality of the yearning of life for wholeness. We become, in fact, the community in question. And so the, so the beloved community is more than, than a, an idea that we put in the program of a church. No, the beloved community is an idea that we put in our souls first. And we become the ethos and the expression of the, the, the power of evolving thought, growing in our thinking. This is what happened to Paul. He was a cosmopolitan. He traveled every, everywhere and could feel at home. There are people who cannot go outside of their physical confines because they are so uh, strapped with fear and trepidation. Not so with Paul. He mingled and associated with persons of all ethnic expressions. He was 2,000 years at least ahead of his time. We can learn much from him. So the first ingredient to put into our lives is, is the power of evolving thought. The second thing that uh, must go into uh, uh, our lives is the ingredient of, of unity and diversity. Now, I'm not talking about unity, the church. I'm talking about unity, the concept, the definition, which can apply to anything. The power of evolving unity and, and diversity. The two are not the same, but both of them need each other in order to be what they are. <laughs> Let me illustrate. A symphony, a musical symphony, consists of different instruments. Saxophone, violin, cello, organ, guitar, piano. All of these instruments are necessary to create a harmonious tone. C minor on an organ does not sound the same as C minor on a guitar. They're different musical instruments. But when all of them are, 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 are working together and the sound comes together, it creates a sound of harmony. Unity cannot abide without diversity. Cannot abide. Now that's going to be on the test. <laughs> Not the test that I will give you, my brothers and sisters, but the test of life. Diversity is here to stay. We act like diversity is a new concept. My brothers and sisters, it is not. But it is so close to us now. Diversity, ethnic diversity, and diversity of all expressions, are, they're so close to us now that we're having to give attention to something that we hadn't given much attention to before. 
And for some of us who have not given attention to, to diversity, you're struggling with a problem, but it's a problem that you can overcome. Paul overcame it. He thought the only people that God loved was the people that looked like him. Poor fellow. <laughs> but there are still people around in our world just like that. Who think that they own God. No religion owns God. And Christians do not have a monopoly on Jesus. Jesus is for everybody, not just for Christians. Jesus is for anyone who wants to come closer to God, who wants to know more about God, who wants to expand his or her understanding about who God is. That's who Jesus is for. We don't own Jesus. Paul had to understand that, but he had to get knocked in the head by lightning from heaven before he began to understand it. But that doesn't have to happen to you or me. And so all of these instruments are making a different sound but producing harmony. This is oneness. The beloved community must resemble the world we inhabit. I've always said to Reverend Michael and to Reverend Karen and to some of the other members of the Unity Ministerial staff that this church has a great opportunity a great opportunity that very few churches have. Why do I say that? Because you have the recipe for building the community and to be a paramount example to the city of Houston and to the world. You have the material at your hand. And so the question is, what are you going to do with the opportunity of the material that you have access to? I think you know what I'm referring to. I need not be plainer. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul. Paul. Paul gets a bad rap because People don't understand him. Oh, you're thinking about the text over in 1 Timothy where he says, women, be silent in the church. If you dig deeper into that and do your background research and the contextualization of that passage, you discover that he was making that assertion in order to protect women in the church from knuckleheads. Amen. Amen. That's why he said women be quiet in the church and when you get home, ask your husband about what you want to know. Paul has been maligned, mis misunderstood, misinterpreted. But who makes a recommendation like the one he made concerning Sister Phoebe? It's difficult to even find that kind of recommendation from a a male pastor concerning a female. We can learn from him. I didn't mean to say all of that about him, but uh, it's your fault. You all keep laughing and saying amen. <laughs> and so when you say amen, it, it inspires me to, to, to preach on. But I am coming to a conclusion. There are 123 Islamic mosques here in the city of Houston. Our Latino population is spilling over into 50%. People from all over the world, from different parts of Asia and Africa, are coming to the United States. And they are not immigrants. They are people that God made. My brothers and sisters, there is no such thing as an e illegal alien. Everything that God made has been stamped with the legality of God's mercy, God's goodness, God's kindness, God's wisdom. These are terms 
that we think of that we come up with to criminalize, to demonize, and to, and to, and to uh, push people to the edge of the society. We need to stop it. There is no such thing as an undocumented person. Everything that God made, the sun, the moon, the stars, every human being has been documented by God's love. A refugee, a refugee is somebody not coming, uh, just coming to the city of Houston to see the Astrodome. Why would a man pick up his three children and his wife from El Salvador, jump on a train or start walking, coming across the Rio Grande if something was not after them? This is where compassion and love kicks in, which is the third ingredient for building God's beloved community. <laughs> refugees, refugees are people with names. Refugee is a political construct designed to, to demonize people who they don't want to, want to understand. But it's too late now because refugees, immigrants, and people are coming from all over the world. And, and if you are paranoid, if you are, are frightened to death by a Muslim woman wearing a hijab, you're frightened to death by a white brother or sister walking down the street, a white a Latino brother or sister walking down the street, or, uh, an African-American male or female walking down the street. If you're frightened to death by people who look different from you, you may want to reconsider living on the planet Earth. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. It's a beautiful world. If you learn how to love. Louis Armstrong was right. It's a beautiful world if you learn how to have compassion. We're moving beyond the old world. The old world is dying. It is decaying because it has lost its authority. And a new world is not just emerging, it is here. And you want to be in the number when the saints go marching in. You want to do your work of putting all the proper ingredients in the pan so that when the cake comes out, you can smile rather than run. <laughs> Amen? Amen? But the ingredients have to be in our hearts, in our souls. We must do the work of evolving thought. My brothers and sisters, we must do the work of evolving unity and diversity. We must do the work of evolving love and compassion. And compassion, love is patient, love is kind, love is good. Yes. And love can be one of the most dangerous words in the human dictionary, in the English dictionary, and the human dictionary too. Because people have done some of the most craziest things in love, uh, 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 about love, but in Paul's letter in his writings, we find a beautiful spiritual description of what love is. Love does not always want its own way. So how are we going to build the beloved community? Are we going to build it the way that we want it? Can't do that. It's either God's way or the highway. Amen? Amen. Not my way. It's God's way. And the way that God has prescribed for his world to be is in the Bible. And there are people, not only Paul, there are people in the Bible, both male and female, that we can learn from as to how to be better human beings. One day in this, on this planet, the love of God will spill over 
and cover this planet like the waters cover the sea. Somewhere up the road, the words of the prophet Amos will become real. Justice will run down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Why? Because you and I will be participants in making it so. May God bless you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.